so firstly thank you everyone so much for coming um this is really exciting um really exciting to me so melton and i had this idea of kind of organizing a list of people um, who are interested in moral psychology, working in moral psychology all around the world to try and open up um, the space of who we're inviting for talks and who we're collaborating with on research and try and make a more globalized and moral psychology. And as part of this, we've organized a seminar series and this is the, um, the very first session, the very first one, um, which is very exciting. Um, and we'll be meeting at this time almost always at this time on Mondays every three weeks. So the next one will be in three weeks um, with, I believe, Hal Gear um, from uh, Norway. Um, great. So but today we've got um, JF or officially um, Jean-Francois, Jean um, but I am English and very bad at French. Um, so he says I can call him JF, um, which is very helpful so I don't embarrass myself too much. Um, so JF is a research director at the Toulouse School of Economics in France. He's the president of the European Commission Expert Group on the Ethics of Driverless Mobility and the head of the AI and Society Programme at the Toulouse uh, Digital Centre. He's published on a number of high impact topics and his work has appeared in more than 100 publications, including um, Nature, Science and PNAS. Something that I found really interesting was that He's actually had continuous funding um, since the year 2000 as a PI or a co-investigator with more than 18 grants, which is an astounding fact to me as I received my latest grant rejection today. Um, and his funding institutions have in, uh, included the European Union and lots of French institutions that again, out of respect for the French people, I'm not gonna try and pronounce. Um, he's most well known for his moral machine paper and an amazing statistic to me is that around one in 500 internet users have completed this. And this moral machine um, website project was an internet sensation. Um, the YouTubers um, commenting on it and many papers, uh, many articles in the press. So he really um, kind of brought these questions of moral psychology to um, the broader public. And I'm really thrilled to have him here kicking us off. So with that, I'm gonna pass over to JF and um, thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, one quick housekeeping thing. Um, if you want to put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom, um, and then you should be able to upvote questions that you're really interested in hearing from other people. And then what we'll do is when we get to the end, we'll do the Q&A kind of working down from the most popular questions, basically. So if you have questions, put in the Q&A at the bottom. Okay, and with that, um, over to you, JF, thank you. Thanks, Jim, and um, thanks everyone for being there, for being here. It's very exciting to launch this series. Okay, I'm gonna share that screen. Uh, and there are two things that I'd like to say before I start. So first, uh, the topic is grim. I'm going to talk about issues of life and death, not in relation to abstract trolley problems, say, but in relation to, well, real life policies that could affect many of us in pandemic times. So I'm going to try to be sensitive about this, but I just want to apologize in advance if at any point during the talk, someone feels uncomfortable or upset about what I'm saying. Second thing is more uh, of a request. Uh, I'm going to ask you to please not take pictures of the slide and share them on the internet. It's just that I prefer people to hear the explanation that comes with the slide instead of just seeing the slide in isolation on Twitter. And I'm sure you can understand that I probably have been burned by this before. Okay, so that being out of the way, uh, let's start. So I'm going to talk about policies that impact who lives and who dies. So the key word here is policies. I'm not interested so much in uh, individual decisions made by a specific person uh, in specific circumstances. I'm more interested in how as a society, we set up guidelines for the people who are going to make the decisions. 
the people or the machines actually, because my first example uh, at the bottom left of the screen is self-driving cars. So in the uh, example here that you see, the self-driving car is about to crash in a family of pedestrians who are crossing the street. And the only way to save these pedestrians would be for the car to swerve and hit the obstacle. But by doing so, it would endanger the lives of its passengers who happen to be a pregnant woman and her little boy. So the question is, you know, how should self-driving cars behave in situations like that when they cannot save everyone? My second example will be much closer to us uh, right now. Uh, second example will be vaccines. So as long as we don't have enough vaccines to give to everyone, we have to have policies about who gets vaccine first. And many, many countries uh, have been, well, experimenting with these policies uh, during these past few weeks or months. Uh, my third example will be ventilators because one of the big scares of 20, 2020 was that we would not have enough ventilators for the COVID-19 patients that needed them. Because the people who develop the worst, most severe form of COVID-19 cannot uh, breathe by themselves. They need to be sedated, paralyzed, and hooked to a machine that makes them breathe artificially. So that machine is the ventilator. And during the spring of 2020, I think all the countries in the world started worrying that they would not have enough ventilators for all the COVID-19 patients who would need them. And so that the doctors would have to make very, very hard decision about which patients would get the ventilator and which patient would be well uh, eased into dying. So in order to avoid that situation, most countries went to extreme uh, measures like ramping up the, the, the production of ventilators, but also uh, adopting severe lockdown procedures to stop the pandemic, really because the big scares was how to make these decisions. But uh, in preparing for this uh, uh, eventuality, all the countries scrambled up to develop policies that would help the doctors make the decision if it had to come uh, to that. So I'm going to discuss this, but uh, my purpose is not really to discuss the content of the policies that have been adopted by say Italy or the Netherlands. What I do with my team and my co-authors is to uh, gauge the support for different kind of priorities, different kind of policies in these three examples. Because one thing that these uh, three examples have in common is that we're very well known. I'm pretty sure that most of you have heard of the three examples already. And that's because there's been a lot of discussion in the media about these three examples. These policies have been elaborated under high public scrutiny. The people are watching what the policymakers are doing. And because the people are watching, they form opinions about what should be done. And what we do is that we collect, we run experiments to collect data to extract what we think are the preferences in the population about uh, what the policies should prioritize. So we typically do that in multiple countries. Uh, the order of magnitude would be that we collect data in somewhere between 10 and 100 countries. Now, why do we do this? So first, there's the obvious, I guess, obvious interest that we provide this resource, which is large scale data for morality researchers to help them, uh, well, test or develop the theories. Uh, we have this massive data sets about realistic problems, realistic moral dilemmas that we collect in many places in the world that will allow you to both assess what the preferences of people are and the cross-cultural uh, variation in these preferences. So there is this interest in producing these resources, but we also think that we can help policymakers make uh, their decisions. So this is very tricky because this is where we get the most criticism. So I wanna dissipate very quickly two misconceptions about this kind of work. First, we never make any normative assumption. We never assume that what the majority wants in our data is the correct moral perspective is the correct moral action. 
And then we never make any prescriptive assumption. That is, we never assume that policymakers should simply do what the majority wants in our data sets. So it's, ne it's never normative, never descriptive. That being said, there is a role for this data in policymaking. So to identify this role, we just have to think first, what happens when the policies and the preferences of the citizens are misaligned? Well, the response is that when you have this misalignment between the policies and the preferences of the public, you get loss of trust. People lose trust in the system. And this loss of trust has downstream consequences which are negative. For example, uh, in pandemic times, you're usually asking a lot of your citizens. You're asking to comply to a lot of non-pharmaceutical interventions and social distancing and so on. So, a lot, so if your citizens lose trust in what you're doing, they might actually comply less, which is a very bad thing. And, and second, there's the opting out problem that is mostly a problem for something like self-driving cars, which is that if your citizen think that the risk distribution policies of your self-driving cars are unfair, they lose trust in self-driving cars, they opt out of using them, which means that they opt out of using a technology that is objectively safer. Well, or will be at some point. Okay, so there is a cost to pay when the policies and the preferences are misaligned. Does that mean that you have to do what the people want? No, again, it's, we don't claim there is a prescriptive value to this data. The point is not for the policymakers to blindly follow the preferences of citizens. The policymakers have to do what they think is best, but if they know about the preferences of the population and they know they're going to do something that is very unpopular, then they know where to concentrate the explanations. No, they know what needs the most pedagogy. So you have to be aware when you're policymakers about this potential misalignment, concentrate your explanation wherever needed. And maybe, just maybe, okay? If your experts disagree on something, if your experts cannot tell you if it's a good thing to do this or that, then maybe, just maybe, use citizen preference as a tiebreaker and give people what they want if the expert themselves are not sure whether it's the right thing or not, okay? Right, so this is what we do with this data. So time to uh, tell you about the typical workflow. So this is how it goes. We first identify a policy issues. Here, self-driving cars. Okay, how do we program self-driving cars to distribute risks or actually distribute crashes uh, over road users? Policy, you know, policy problem identified. Now we list the metrics, the possible metrics that you can use to make this decision. So for example, in the self-driving car examples, do we want the policy to take into account the age of the potential victims? Like, do we want the car to detect kids and give them priority in terms of safety? Uh, do we want to, the cars to take into account the fact that some of the victims are pedestrians and some of the potential victims are car passengers? And so on. So you come with this list of metrics. When we have the metrics, we deploy the experiments, which are usually choice experiments, where uh, we give people pairs of outcomes and they decide which one is, well, the least worse. And from a big data set of choices like that, we extract their preferences. So for the self driving car examples, we deployed what uh, Jim mentioned earlier, which is the Moral Mission website, which was quite a hit. And so thanks to the popularity of the moral machine websites, we got decent samples in more than 100 countries. I think right now, nowadays, we have probably 8 million users or something like that, uh, that completed the full survey. Okay, so that was for self-driving cars. No second example, vaccines, same thing. We identified the policy issues, who should get the vaccine first. We come with a list of metrics. Should the policy take into account the age of the recipient? Should the policy take into account the income of the recipient? Like, do we want to prioritize the poor? Once we have the metrics, we deploy. And for the vaccine study, we collected data in only uh, 13 countries, but we obtained national representative samples in these 13 countries. And no, you know the drill. Last example, ventilators. We come with the metrics. Should the policy take into account the age of the patient? Should the policy take into account the expected quality of life? 
of the patient after uh, surviving the process. So here for the ventilator survey, we had four nationally representative samples and 20 uh, additional self-selected samples from, uh, well, 20 countries. Now, as you can imagine, there's absolutely no way I can tell you about every result, every finding of every metric for every example in every country uh, during the time I've got now. So I'm not even gonna try to uh, give you a full perspective on this mountain of data. I'm just gonna give you three highlights, three things that struck me after spending a long time trekking across this mountain of data, three things that have stayed with me so far. And actually the third one is a bit of a mystery that maybe I will get your help about. Okay, first highlight what I call the qualitative universals. There is a very striking phenomenon. So in all these studies, it seems that the structure of the data is that we find something that is true everywhere in all the countries. So sure, there is a quantitative variations in the results, but there is a qualitative structure that is universal. So for example, for the crashes, the directional preferences are universal, all of them. So for example, the preference for saving humans versus non-humans, the preference for saving more lives versus fewer lives, the preference for saving younger lives rather than older lives, down to the weaker, the weakest preferences, for example, the preference for saving women versus men or saving pedestrians versus car passengers, all these preferences are directionally the same in every country. This is very striking, right? Everywhere, except I think in one place like the Sultanate of Oman or something like that, uh, there's a preference for saving women over men for crashes. No, the direction is the same, but the strength of the preference can vary quite a lot from one country to another. Okay, so for example, uh, here we could identify three big clusters of countries with different profiles of preferences, but the direction, remember, is always the same. It's just the strength that varies. So for example, uh, the preference for saving younger character, or say the preference for age, is weaker in Middle Eastern and Eastern countries. And the preference for saving high income versus low income uh, victims is stronger in the South, in South America and mostly in countries with a lot of inequality and weaker in rich countries. So there's a lot going on in terms of how the preferences can vary from one country to another, but directionally they're always the same. Similar thing happens with vaccines. So for example, uh, the priority for healthcare workers, non-remote workers, vaccinate the vulnerable, the old and the poor, that's something we find in every country that we tested directionally. Because then the strength, the relative strength of these preferences, of course, is gonna vary. And for example, we find again, actually, and this is quite striking, that we find that the preference for age is weaker in China and the uh, preference for income, the, the role of income is weaker in rich countries, which is exactly what we found for crashes, right? That the age variable was not as important in the East and the income variable was not as important in rich countries. For the ventilator, things are not as straightforward and I don't think I can do them justice. So I'm just gonna allude to this and I can go back to it in the Q&A. The universal for the ventilators is actually the polarized nature of the responses that we find in every country. So what happens is that in every country that we tested, you have these two, two big groups of people that together account for the majority of the population. And one big group of people is completely opposed to any kind of policy. They just want the ventilators to be allocated on a first come first serve basis. And, you know, when there are not enough ventilators because they've been given to everyone, well, tough luck. Something like that. 
That's one big group of people. And then you have the other big group of people. And these people are open to the most forward, complete form of triage you can imagine. They're okay with using any kind of individual information about the patient in a very complicated uh, series of decision to allocate a ventilator to somewhere or not. So you got this big polarization between the no triager and the full triager that we find in every country. So that was my first highlight. Usually we always, well, well, it's not usually, we always find some kind of universal qualitative structure in the data that is then, you know, uh, complicated by some quantitative variation across cultures. Now, uh, moving on to my highlights number two and three, I need first to tell you a little more about the metrics, actually very little. But I just want to emphasize that uh, sometimes some metrics are only used in one context. So for example, income was only used for the vaccine study, not for the other studies. Quality of life was only used for the ventilator study. Why? Because it's only ever been discussed in the context of ventilators. It doesn't, I mean, you couldn't perhaps make a point that it makes sense in the other uh, context, but it's never been discussed. So why you know, include it in the surveys, okay? Some metrics like prognosis can be used you know, in the context, but there are two metrics that are featured in all three examples, and these are my next two highlights. So these two metrics that we've included in all surveys are age, should the policy take into account the age of people when making the allocation decision, and something which I'm very carefully calling social value with big scare quotes, because, yeah, you're going to see this is complicated, triggering issue. So first, age. So I'm going to say a few words about why. What, why would you want these policies to take into account age? What is your rationale for saying that age is important when you make these life and death decisions? So when people uh, rationalize the use of age in this kind of policy, it's important to remember that they never use age as a simple number. Age is always a proxy for something else. So the typical case is that you use, use age as a proxy for proximity to death. That is, you consider that the older someone is, well, probabilistically, the closer that person is to death. So here, that means that usually you say, I've got a 12-year-old, a 70-year-old, I'm using age as a proxy to predict that the 70 year old is gonna die sooner than the 12 year old. And I'm not only saving lives, I'm saving life years. And so by using age as a proxy for predicting the proximity to death, I'm saying that the 12, saving the 12 year old saves more life years, okay? There's another way to look at this, which is to look at age, not as a proxy for proximity to death, but distance from birth and when you do this, the people who would do this usually mean that um, age is a proxy for the opportunity to experience life milestones. So you have this 12-year-old and the 70-year-old. And what you're saying is that the 12-year-old has not had yet the experience to go through puberty, to form a romantic bond with someone else, to raise kids, and that the 70-year-old probably probabilistically had these opportunities. So remember, you know, it wasn't sure when you're using age as a you know, probabilistic prediction of the time of death, it's kind of uncertain. And here too, it's kind of uncertain. You know, you're not gonna ask the person, hey, uh, did you raise kid? Did you love someone? You know, before I make the decision to keep you alive or not, right? You're just using that as a proxy. But either, whether you consider age as proximity to death or distant from birth, uh, the end result is the same. At the end of the day, you're going to penalize the older individuals. Okay, let's complicate this a little because you can also use age as a, proximity, as a proxy for vulnerability. Now, what you're doing, for example, for uh, vaccination is that you say older patients are statistically more vulnerable conditional infection. That is, they're at a higher risk of dying if they get infected. So you use age as, as, as a proxy for vulnerability. And now the logic is that you want to actually 
prioritize the older individuals because age is a proxy for their vulnerability to the disease. And you think it's fair to protect them. But because it cannot be that simple, even when you consider age as a proxy for vulnerability, you might end up with the opposite conclusion. And that's the case for ventilators. Because no, what you're saying is that when you consider ventilation, artificial ventilation, age is also a proximity for vulnerability, but in the sense that older individuals are less likely to survive the invasive process of artificial ventilation. And so you're saying that statistically, this very old person uh, might not survive the mere hooking up with the machine. And so you're maybe better off giving the ventilator to someone with a better chance of surviving the process, which means some, someone younger. Okay, so it's always important to remember that age is always a proxy for something and the kind of proxy you're using is going to drive uh, the direction of the priority you set up in your policy. But remember, I'm not in the business of saying what is right or wrong in these policies. I'm in the business of collecting uh, data about what people would prefer. So what we find for crashes, we find a strong, very strong preference against older characters. So a very strong tendency to sacrifice the older characters in the crash dilemmas. Actually, this uh, preference is the uh, strongest after uh, saving humans versus non-humans and saving more lives versus fewer. So it's really, it ranks very high. And interestingly, there's also a preference for saving uh, kids and babies over adults. Coming back to this later. For the ventilators, where you remember uh, age makes you more vulnerable to the process, so age is an argument against get, getting the ventilator, we also find a moderate strong preference against older patients, which is actually the second highest preference that we find. And then we have vaccines. Remember, that's the only case where you can actually make a case that older people should get the vaccine first. And here, what we find is a weak preference only for giving the vaccine to older individuals. Actually, this comes after a long series of preferences for all kinds of people who cannot work remote. Basically, you have all the jobs where people cannot work remote. And after all these people, you get older individuals. So I think that overall, when you consider all this data, there's a reasonable suggestion that people deprioritize older individuals in those dilemmas, because even in the situation where you can make a reasonable case that older individuals should get priority, you only find the weakest of preferences. And I think this data also suggests that people intuitively use age as a proxy for you know, experience of life stages rather than proximity to death. That is that they want to save babies and kids as if you know, that would give them a, you know, the, the, the opportunities to experience life instead of just looking at how close people are to death. But that's very much open. And I think uh, the job of future research is going to clarify this. Highlight three, and this is where things get really thorny. Social value. Okay. So here the question is, should we? Should we consider this first? You know, should policies, life and death policies, consider what someone's contribution to society is when deciding whether that person must live or die? And remember, I'm pretty much agnostic, really. Well, I'm personally not agnostic, but I'm, as a scientist, as a psychologist, I am. But so my question as a psychologist is more like, do people have preferences in that direction? Do, do they think we should use uh, social value or contribution to society as a metric to decide who lives or who dies? When we started working on crashes, we thought that the response, would, well, the responses were pretty obvious. We thought that the responses were no and yes. No, policies should not consider our contribution to society, but yes, people being people, probably if we're gonna, uh, use this metric in their decisions. And that's the reason why we introduce harmless characters in the moral machine experiment. So, you know, examples like this one, you know, the car is going to crash into this homeless person, but it could save the homeless person by crashing into the obstacle and killing its passenger. 
So, you know, the fact that the person is homeless should not make a difference. Well, again, in a kind of normative way, you know, we don't want that into policy. But when you look at what people say in these scenarios, you find something a bit different. What we find, what we found that is that choices, the choices that people make in the moral machine reveal a clear penalty for the homeless characters. Something that was again pretty high, actually, that was the next thing to age in terms of the penalty that a character could uh, could incur in the moral machine scenarios. So people had a tendency to kill the homeless quite a lot in the experiment. But when we asked them, you know, do you think this should be included in the policy? Their explicit preference was against it. They preferred this to be not considered at all. So, so far, so good, right? We sort of agree that we should not consider uh, someone's contribution to society or social value when making these choices, that people, okay, have implicit biases but then their explicit preference neutralized these simplest biases. So end of story, right? But then came the pandemic. So remember, I told you that uh, spring 2020, uh, every country is scrambling up because everyone is afraid that we're not gonna have enough ventilators. So you've got all these policies about ventilator allocation uh, being developed at the same time in all those different countries. Okay, so many of this, um, policies, many of these guidelines start with some kind of lofty statement that they will never consider things like, and then you have a long list of things like race and sexual preferences and contribution to society and so on, that these things would never be considered. Okay, so they state that they will never consider one's contribution to society when making the decision to allocate a ventilator. And then you read the following. And very often, you find that they sort of make one exception. Can you guess? Can you guess which category of people uh, have some contribution to society that is maybe worth giving them the ventilator in priority? Well, healthcare workers. And here uh, you find two sorts of justifications. Either the policy say something like, well, you know, these were frontline soldiers. These people took high personal risk in taking care of other people. And so if they develop a severe form and they need a ventilator to survive, we should give them the ventilator because of their past contribution. Or you have the slightly coldest version, the instrumental utilitarian version, which is, look, uh, we're in for the long run. We're gonna need a lot of social of healthcare workers for this pandemic. So if, if we got an, a healthcare worker needing a ventilator to survive, we give them the ventilator so that they'll survive and they can later be back to work and fight the pandemic. So again, you know, we give them the ventilators either as a reward for their past contribution to society or as a way to preserve their future contribution to society. But if you find yourself convinced by either of both these justifications, you have to, you know, to realize that no, you're making an exception. You're saying that actually it's okay sometimes to look at what someone can contribute to society when making the decision to give that person a rare resource that will make a difference, a life and death difference. And where do you stop? And that's actually where things got heated because when people say, wait, you know, if we're making an exception for the social contribution of healthcare worker, why don't we do that for all frontline workers or firefighters or, People doing delivery or workers in industries who cannot work remote, you know, why would social healthcare workers would be treated so specially? So what did we find? Because remember, uh, we have social value in the moral machine. I told you about that, but we tested whether people would uh, give priority to healthcare workers in the vaccine and in the ventilator case. So what we found is that uh, this is the weakest possible preference for ventilator allocation. And actually the global trend, global, right? As always variations, but the global trend is for people to oppose this priority. People are on average 
against healthcare workers getting a ventilator in priority. Yeah, I'll let that sink in because that's probably a very hard thing to accept of healthcare workers, that people might you know, display a lot of admiration for the job that healthcare workers are doing, but we're not quite ready to turn that into a policy that would give healthcare workers top priority to get ventilators. And that means that their patients would not get the ventilator. But then we did that for vaccines. And for vaccines, people express the strongest possible preference for healthcare workers to get the vaccine first. And I mean, by you know, far, far, far the strongest preferences, it came like, it was twice as strong as the next preference. So if this was a regular seminar, I would have loved to have a dinner conversation with you about this discrepancy that we find. I'm sure there's an explanation, but I'm personally a bit puzzled. And I mean, it's not like it's a one shot thing. It's something that we find everywhere, remember, uh, almost everywhere, this discrepancy where people think that, of course, give the vaccines to healthcare, healthcare workers because you know we need to reward them and to preserve their contribution. But no, don't give them the ventilators first, which is very cold. All right, so as I said, it would have been great to have a conversation, but uh, I wanna keep some time for questions. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna give a big shout out to all my wonderful uh, co-authors on the three papers that I described today. Um, the moral machine experiment, you can uh, very easily find. The uh, vaccine paper is available on Med Archive. And the ventilator paper, I'm sorry, is not uh, ready for prime time right now. So you can't read that one uh, yet. All right. Thanks a lot. I'm sure everyone is clapping at home, but um, alas, we cannot see or hear them. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was a really interesting talk. Um, we. We've got a few questions um, come up in the chat. Um, so the first question is from Christian Elbeck um, from Aarhus, I seem to remember, Denmark. Um, he's put, Dear JF, thanks for a super interesting presentation. Have you looked into how social value choices differ between countries with varying levels of economic inequality? Uh, absolutely, yes. And the response is that uh, usually the effects are stronger when the inequality is stronger. So basically what we do is just take the Gini index and we correlate the effect size with the Gini index. And uh, we do find that uh, the greater the inequality, the greater the importance of social value. Um, next, Jesse has asked if age is a proxy if age is a proxy for proximity to death have you also included scenarios that featured people who are young but close to death for example due to terminal well due to terminal and it's not for example just due to terminal illness. no we've not and uh and i would be super interested in uh, in seeing this kind of data um, just a note to everyone, if you could put questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, that would be um, just uh, easier to monitor in one place. Um, uh, okay, next question, Jesse, Jesse Sun again has asked, um, in the homeless scenario, I wonder whether people's choices are being driven by contribution to society um, or whether it's those preferences reflecting social integration. So a preference for saving those who'd have more friends or family members that would suffer as a result of that person's death, whereas a homeless person is seen more as a, you know, island. Yeah, I think that's the fair interpretation. And uh, I don't know, I don't have any quantitative data to back this up, but from a qualitative perspective, okay, if you watch people on YouTube, during doing the moral machine. And I think there are like thousands of videos like that, but it's true that I hear that 
I've watched some of these videos and I kind of heard that people saying this about harmless crackers. So no evidence, but yeah, anecdotal indication that this is at play for at least some people. Yes, absolutely. Um, next we've got, I guess this is a question from Killian, but I will say Killian, this looks more like a comment than a question. Um, if they have the vaccine, they can continue working, but if they're on a ventilator, they're not working and also taking up valuable ventilator space. I guess that's sort of a suggestion for um, this discrepancy between the vaccine, vaccine and ventilators. Yeah, true. Although, and it's true that this is part of the debate was that uh, if you get ventilated for three weeks, for example, you're not going to be back to work. Uh, you're going to spend six months, uh, you know, uh, getting back in shape and being back to work. So the instrumental value is not that clear. But you have to remember still that uh, here we, I mean, not being put on a ventilator, not to be to you know not to beat around the bush means that you're going to die. Uh, so so we're saying that these people are left to die. I mean, not left to die. They is up in to dying, but. Uh, so it seems like a very, very, uh, well, surprising choice to say that they should not get the ventilator. Um, Amanda Austin has said, could age not also be included in the concept of social value? So younger people may be perceived as being more able to contribute to society in the future. Uh, I, I, I'm never sure if the questions are like from the point of view of the policymaker, like would it make sense to do things that way or from a psychological perspective, do people perceive it that way? Uh, do people perceive it that way? I don't know. Uh, from a policymaking perspective, you're not supposed to do this. Uh, this is more like an actuarial uh, thing where if you lose a family member and the insurance is compensating you, they will sort of try to assess what would have been the uh, earnings of that person in the future and try to compensate you for future earnings. But in policymaking, you typically not allowed to consider this. And for us, for a psychological thing, well, I don't know, probably. That's also, may I say, uh, also a problem with this, that we're using these metrics because apart from the crashes where we had to work from scratch. But for the ventilators or the vaccine, what we're doing is that we read all the policies that have been developed in various countries and we extract the metrics from these policies. And I agree that sometimes ew, these things overlap, you know, like prognosis and quality of life and comorbidities, all these things are intercorrelated. And so it might feel a bit artificial to separate them in the surveys because you know, they're not cleanly separated. But the thing is, is that's how they're used in the actual policies. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Robert Bohm um, from Copenhagen now, I think, has said maybe health workers are treated differently when it comes to prevention, but not when it comes to intervention. So one could argue that by prioritizing them in, in preventative measures, they're further benefits to society. Um, and he's suggesting that maybe that could contribute to this uh, difference you find between vaccines and ventilators. Yeah, no, yeah, I think I think there's definitely something about preserving their instrumental value and that this is very clear for vaccines and clear for ventilators. And that uh, if I have to venture a guess, I think this is what is on people's mind and they're much less sensitive to the idea of rewarding uh, the healthcare worker for the risk they took in the past, yeah. Okay. And then um, next we've got uh, Vilius from Lithuania. Um, he's asking, is there any speculation on how widely this phenomenon of the qualitative universality of moral preferences would generalize? So um, are there any counterexamples to um, this seeming universality? Oh, they must be, right? But the thing is when you start seeing this pattern of qualitative universal quantitative variation you start seeing it in many places and some things it's almost some trivial like in a dictator game or an economic game like that i mean universally people think it's 
good to share. I mean, it's better to share than to hoard. No, the strength of the preference for sharing or hoarding might differ in different societies. You might get away with less sharing in some places, but directionally, I'm not sure there's a single society where people are think that sharing is bad. And uh, for example, the role of intention in moral blame, the fact that you blame more if you do something intentionally rather than non-intentionally. Uh, of course, there's a lot of variation and we know there's a lot of variation documented. And in extreme cases, people are speaking about some small scale societies where perhaps the effect does not exist. Okay, But I've never heard of a society where people have the opposite pattern and say that they think that doing something, do something bad on purpose is less bad than doing it accidentally. So I'm thinking that, yes, it might be very often the case actually that you find some kind of qualitative universality. Thank you. I'm going to try something. Um, Dries Boston, you put your hand up. I think, oh, I, I think you're allowed to talk now if you'd like to say your question. I presume that's why you had your hand up unless this was a mistake and I just ruined everything. Yeah, I'm afraid that was a mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a misclick. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> But apparently I can do that. So if anyone would like to ask your question, um, like verbally, just type it, type that in the chat or something. And then um, I can I can do that apparently. I'm sorry, this is the first time we're running this and I've never actually run a webinar before. Um, okay, great. So the next question, um, ah, interesting question from John Mills, um, who's asking if you could go into a little more detail about the recruitment process for the moral machine study. Um, how did you go about that? Um, and also actually I'd be interested for the ventilator. I think it was the ventilator study that you also did the, uh, the non-representative as well. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So the moral machine, uh, I don't think it can be easily reproduced, but uh, basically we, we, we had a problem of scale that we had so many scenarios that there was absolutely no way we could hire enough people, even on Amtrak and something like that, to, to, to actually uh, take the survey. And so we tried for virality. And so it's a very long story. It's a different talk, actually, when I describe all the strategy, all the little choices that we made uh, to make the website viral and how weird it is to design the product as a scientist. Like I have this kind of startup feeling having consultant, you know, look at your logo, look at your social media strategy and your media strategy. So many, many, many decisions were made to increase the chance that we would go viral and uh, it worked, but uh, luck played a big role. And I must say the biggest factor uh, that uh, just drew people to the website was actually YouTube. And that's something that we did not anticipate that people like PewDiePie or those people with 40 million followers would do videos on the moral machine and then that would snowball into this. So we did everything we could to make the, sur the survey viral and it worked. So we're actually working at this moment on a similar project that we hope we will be able to make viral, but, uh, and I could, yeah, spend an entire talk describing uh, the kind of meetings and the kind of decisions we have to make about this. But anyway, and for, but the beauty of the moral machine of the success of the moral machine is that it's still going very strong, which means that sometimes if we have another survey, we can just put a link on the, uh, well, on the moral machine front page. And because we have thousands of people visiting the moral machine every day, even if 1% of them uh, take the survey that we advertise, we can still get, you know, 40,000, 50,000 uh, participants per survey. We try not to do it too much, but yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, we've got the next question from Halgir, who is our speaker, I think for in three weeks time, who's asking, do you think that the expected contribution to society for prioritizing health care workers is perceived as larger for vaccines um, because it keeps them safe in the first place than for ventilators that are mostly about treating people who are already sick, already sick? So it's kind of more preventative. Well, yeah, I think we've had this discussion already, but yes, I think 
it's true that the instrumental value is uh, much more obvious in the case of uh, vaccines than in the case of ventilators, but I'm still surprised that given the stakes of the decision, uh, people would, well, essentially say that no, uh, healthcare workers do not deserve a ventilator more than any other person. But you're, you're right, uh, post hoc, it seems clear that uh, one explanation is that people go for the instrumental value and the instrumental value is clear in the vaccine case and clear in the ventilator, in the ventilator case. It's so interesting how we all have um, such different intuitions here. So as you said, it, you know, that, that we wouldn't think the healthcare workers um, should have a, a higher right. Whereas to me, I'm very much like, well, of course they shouldn't have a higher right. Why, why should they have more of a right to be, receive it than other people? Um, it's so interesting to hear how everyone has these such obvious armchair intu intuitions. that, um, And that's why this data that you collect on all these topics is so interesting to actually see how people are responding to these and, and where it can differ from our own intuitions. Um, so next question is from Trisha, um, who's asked, is another component that you could consider um, for prioritizing the vaccine, the risk being undertaken? So healthcare workers are more likely to be exposed to the vaccine, to the virus, sorry. Uh, yes, okay. So for something I did not get into about that survey is that we gave people uh, the direct information about risk of uh, catching and transmitting and risk of dying if infected, as well as the proxy. So for example, we would manipulate, you know, what it, well, when you tell people this person has five times the risk of being infected, they react very strongly to that, okay? And then you, when you use as a proxy, you know, that person is a healthcare worker, they might react differently or, oh God, I'm, completely messing this up. So I'm just gonna take a pass. Yes, there is a response to that, but I just can't make it right right now. That's great. Yeah, you, you, you've, you've been dealing with an awful lot of questions and you, know, you should really have left less time for questions. You've made the, the, the wrong choice here. You're supposed to keep talking and then only have time for one or two easy questions. Um, so the next question um, is something I was wondering, um, is from Ori Friedman, who's asked, in the car dilemmas, have you manipulated full? So is the pedestrian jaywalk, jay jaywalking, jaywalking, or is the car driving too quickly? Um, the sense of uh, responsibility, I guess. Yeah, so not the car, but yes, we had the jaywalking thing. So in some scenarios, you, you, we showed the, the lights for pedestrians so that it was clear where the pedestrian actually had the right to cross at that time or was jaywalking. And it makes a big difference. Uh, so remember, we've got the big three, which are human, uh, more lives, age. And then we have the two middle two, which are uh, fault and being homeless, which are at the same level. That is that basically the penalty for being homeless is the same as the penalty for jaywalking. And the effect size for jaywalking was correlated uh, at the cross-national level with the rule of law. So people who live in country when they're used to see people breaking the rules and not being punished for it are more tolerant of jaywalking in the moral machine experiments. Thank you. Um... Okay, and uh, I guess this is probably going to be the penultimate question from Beth Ann um, at um, London Business School, I think, has asked, people have a preference, you mentioned that people have a preference for younger individuals as a proxy for experienced life stage and not just the um, remaining life years. Could you elaborate how you tease those apart, how you tease apart those two explanations the preference is younger for younger people? Well, I don't. Uh, no, I don't because I said, no, I'm going to be careful here. Maybe m I expressed myself too strongly. Uh, I, I, I don't think we have evidence for this. I think my intuition when I look at the data is it, that is what is going on. But we definitely need uh, actual controlled experiments for teasing these supports. 
my intuition is also that I think uh, proximity to death is more vague actually, is more uncertain than uh, opportunity to have experienced life stages. You know, when you see a kid, it's pretty clear that that kid has not had the opportunity to form a romantic bond or to raise children of his or her own. It's, it's a given. Uh, but guessing how many life, well, how many years someone has to live is something like that feels like so uncertain. So I think intu- my intuition is that people uh, are more sensitive to this uh, distance from birth, think, experience life stages than to uh, proximity to death, which is harder to compute. But it's just an intuition. I mean, and I guess I'm thinking the probably both of those come into it um, in the way that policy policies are actually implemented. I was thinking we have this notion of qualies, right? Quality of life years um, left that is a feature taken into account in allocated medical resources. And that that's the quality of the life years left, which is sort of this combination, I guess, of how long until you die, but also how worthwhile um, experience making those years could be. Um, Anyway, um, okay, so last question. Um, <laughs> I've got so much to say, but I'm just going to connect with you after and avoid just dominating this symposium with like a, a chat of me and you. Um, so the last question um, is from Ori again. Um, with regards to the ventilator versus vaccine finding for healthcare workers, does this support the notion that people care more about the future contributions of healthcare workers than the past contributions? Yes, I think. Yes. We've yes. gone for this. Yes. yes. <laughs> I think that's that would be a very reasonable, well, a kind of description of what is going on. I'm not sure it's okay. an explanation, but it's at least a good description of what is going on. Okay, so with that, I'm actually, because that was so quick, I am going to check just one more question, which is a bit different. And this is the last one. Um, And this is from uh, Tripat Gill, who's asked from, and you did talk about this a little bit at the start, but I'd love to hear some more. Um, From a policymaker's perspective, should these findings be used to justify the policy to the public? Or should they not use the studies to, as a justification and just use them internally? So I guess this question is not about whether policymakers should decide what to do based on your studies, but that given that they've decided to do a certain thing, how do you feel about them using the results of such work in communicating their policies? Well, I think they just cannot uh, use the study to justify uh, the policies. And I say that as someone who spent 18 months in Brussels, uh, you know, helping to elaborate policies, for self-driving cars, there's simply no way you can use this data to justify the decision to make. Your decisions must be argued in terms of ethical principles and legal principles. Uh, of course, it might happen that some of your policies also aligned to what people wanted, and so that what people wanted might have had a role into the shaping of the policies, but I think you simply cannot use public survey opinion uh, to justify policies. I think the role is really about discussing with the experts what you want and what you need to do, and then knowing what's gonna be very easy to, well, sell to your population and what's gonna be very hard. And, and, and that's where you need to concentrate the explanations. Mm-hmm. So that makes sense. I guess the problem is if you sort of use these studies, even if that's not the reason you for the make the decision, but you use them as part of the explanation. There's a problem that if the data changes, then particip- then people might expect the policy to change, um, which is not necessarily what we want. Um, okay, well, it's now one minute to the hour, whatever hour it is for you. Um, thank you so much, Jaya, for, um, for coming. This was so interesting, lots to think about. Um, And thanks to all of you who've come and asked questions and for bearing with us as we do this first event and sort of learn as we're going along. Um, And we'll be doing this again in three weeks at the same time on Monday, um, where we'll be hearing from Halgir. So please do join, register, um, and uh, thanks everyone for coming and have a lovely day, morning, afternoon, 
life. Thank you. Bye.